here in the front take a seat and uh, join us because we want to start right uh, with the next keynote presentation. Our second keynote presentation of the day is around the topic of digital sustainability and social innovation. And for this, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Professor Dr. André Reichel. He is a professor for international management and sustainability at the International School of Management here in Stuttgart. He has been a professor for critical management and sustainable development at the Karlshochschule International University in Karlsruhe. And he has a long track record of research in the fields of social um, sustainability and post-growth economy. That said, I would like to say warm welcome, big applause, Professor Dr. André Reichel. Welcome on stage. Great to have you with us. Thank you, sir. So, digitalization. Um, when we talk about digitalization and digital technologies, um, somehow uh, these new forms of technologies, these new forms of business models and solutions um, are supposed to be uh, the cure for all social ills without any need for a lot of political interference, that tech entrepreneurship and the right uh, market solutions will help us in achieving sustainable uh, development here in Germany, in Europe, and across the globe. I have a bit of different uh, perspective on this uh, notion uh, of digitalization. And maybe if you read a nice article in the Handelsblatt a couple of days ago, this in strange term of digitalization is a very German invention. Uh, if you ask an American or, a, or someone from the UK, uh, they probably won't know what we're talking about when we talk about digitalization. They talk about uh, innovation, about tech, or about disruption. Uh, so this is a very German term, and I try to clear up some confusions maybe about this term. But first of all, I want to start with a small thesis here. Uh, and the thesis here is that while digitalization surely is transformative and disruptive uh, for our societies, for the way we produce, we consume, we live our lives, um, it is not good or sustainable. At least not per se. As any new form of technology, uh, as any uh, uh, new product or solution that is introduced, uh, if it is good, if it is sustainable, this belongs or this question can only be addressed by looking at the right political and regulatory framework around it and what digitalization, what these technologies actually need to be sustainable and good. So, and this is the whole question that I try to address, a very Shakespearean question, of course, the question, how can digitalization be transformative for the common good, for sustainability via the means of social innovation? Uh, when we look at uh, these terms that I'm throwing around right now, uh, it might be a good starting point to really look more uh, into these words and what I mean when I talk about digitalization. When the public discourse centers around this uh, strange Neuland uh, that we are entering here in Germany with digitalization, um, we are mostly focusing on the technological aspects uh, of digitalization, on our smartphones, our uh, internet backbones, the server infrastructure, new digital solutions, so the technical installations that we can uh, see and we can use in our everyday lives. Um, this is one aspect uh, of digitalization, and maybe it's not the most interesting aspect when we talk about transformation of society, when we talk about sustainability, and when we talk about social uh, innovation. Maybe just a quick uh, uh, fun fact here. If you're looking up Google Trends and see in Germany for the word dig digitalisierung, digitalization, it's actually a rather new word in the public realm. Um, uh, its meteoric rise started about two years ago. Uh, three or four years ago, everybody was talking about Industry 4.0 or the, industry, uh, the Internet of Things. But hardly in, uh, in, uh, uh, on German television or in the German Bundestag, in the parliament, you heard a politician or a news person talk about digitalization. So it's interesting to see how this term evolved. Nevertheless, when it is discussed, it is most exclusively discussed as a technological phenomenon. As I'm a social scientist, uh, as a background, 
Uh, well, an econ economist and uh, management scientist, so we are from the dark side, but we got the cookies, as you all know. I like to focus on uh, the social aspects of digitalization. And actually, I think it's much more interesting to understand digitalization and what's going on when we focus much more on the social phenomena that come uh, with digitalization. What do I mean here? Um, we all know that at the center of everything that is social is communication between us. The communication between uh, people, uh, the communicative architecture of our organizations, the communicative architecture of our society, of our political system. And it's interesting to see what happens now if we have digital technologies that directly enable us to communicate very, very differently. What kind of effects do these technologies have on our communicative behaviors, on our communicative structures, on our decision structures in organization uh, and in politics. And I think this is where digitalization really has a significant, uh, a significant impact. I'm a system theorist uh, in uh, the tradition of Niklas Luhmann, um, and for me it is very clear if the distribution media of communications change and digitalization changes the way we communicate dramatically, when these change, then of course society itself also has to change and adapt to these new forms of communication, media and technologies. And we see this, especially if you look at young people. Uh, they were the first to adopt it from the late 90s onwards, but of course uh, with mobile internet even more rapidly uh, in the past couple of years, how they communicate. How uh, our entire, let's say, social behavior of going out on a Friday evening has changed over 25 years or so. Uh, the people who are above uh, 35 in the room, which I belong to, or above 40, sorry for that, um, they know that it was very hard uh, if you were leaving the house in the early 90s without having a specific date and point somewhere in space where you meet. If you left the house and something changed, then you had a problem. So normally we meet up at other people's places and then we just stayed there for the rest of the night because somebody uh, discovered alcohol or whatever. Uh, whereas today, of course, we, we leave the house without knowing what's going to happen because we don't have to, because everybody is WhatsApping or whatever they are doing these days. Um, so uh, the social phenomenon of digitalization is much more interesting because it changes the behavior and, of course, uh, the kind of behavior that we see now is also putting, putting huge pressures on organizational processes. Suddenly, uh, uh, a one-way street becomes a two-way street. Suddenly, communication comes back at you when you communicate something as a company, but also in politics. And a lot of the ruptures that we see today can be attributed to the attempts to accommodate these new types of uh, technologies that we have uh, and their effects on social uh, phenomena. Another uh, word that I have to describe or explain is social innovation. It's interesting because this entire conference is called Social Innovation Summit, so we all should have a fairly good understanding what is a social innovation. However, I have a hunch that if, if I would ask any one of you and then the next person that we probably have very different definitions of what a social innovation is actually and how this comes about. Um, and I think the most confusion when it comes to social innovation, just when I talked about the social aspects of digitalization, is the word social. And I'm a scientist, so I try to be very precise here. Social is not being nice to each other. That is the colloquial use of the word. Social is the in-between. The thing that connects a society. Everything that affects the in-between that connects and binds us, this is social. So social innovation affects this somehow. And if you want to have a, a good uh, bedtime reading for, let's say, a Sunday uh, evening or so, I can recommend you um, a wonderful book uh, uh, from Elizabeth Schaff and others. And Schaff, she is a social scientist, and she is one of the proponents of what we call social practice theory. And mind me with the academic excursion here, uh, but it's interesting to understand social innovation by looking at social practices. A social practice um, is, for example, what I do here and what you are doing, what we, what we are jointly constituting here. There is a guy on stage and there are people down there. Very clear what's going to, what's going to happen. This guy is talking, you are listening. And the room structure and our upbringing tell us what 
we should do, what kind of practices are okay, and what we need to have them. Cooking is another social practice. We know what we need for cooking, and coming to a place like Witzemann Space, we also know uh, we take hopefully all the tram here in Stuttgart and uh, walk down the BE14 uh, uh, and inhale lots of uh, nice car air or something like that. Um, so what is a social practice, and how do they change? Social practices have, can be understood with three different elements that all have to come together to constitute such a practice. The first element is meaning. Every social practice has a meaning. The practice here of speaking to an auditorium or being an auditorium, we all share the same meaning structures. We know what's going to happen and why this is important that there's one guy speaking and the other people are listening. When we are cooking, we understand the concept of food, of preparation of food, and the value maybe of making uh, the tomato soup by yourself and not just buying a product from uh, Nestlé, the greatest criminals on this planet. So, um, sorry if Nestlé is in the room, you're good people. No, actually, they are really trying, they're really trying. I know there are good CSR people working at Nestlé, um, and I, I pray for them every night, and I <laughs> pity them sometimes as well. When I say cooking um, uh, or trying to sell water to people, what you also need to do is you need a certain skill set. Everyone um, here in the room probably can cook, I'm not so sure, but probably tried to cook or maybe just left it because, no, I'm sorry, it's not for me. Making a tomato soup by yourself requires not just an understanding why it's healthy to do it, it also requires certain skills how to do it. Capitalism now is a curious program in the economy because capitalism normally de-skills us. You don't have to cook. You can just buy the package and add water, that's easy. Or just go out, somebody else will do it for you. Um, uh, but this is also then a new form of practice, a new form of skills, that I buy food, processed food, that is made by someone else. So this is very individual. Uh, and then, of course, we also need materials. We need a, a, all these practices come with materials attached. When you cook, you need, of course, uh, a, a kitchen, you need uh, uh, spoons and forks and knives, and, of course, the products that you use, and the tomatoes if you make a soup, and all these things. So you need all that stuff. When we want to have a, a, a conference here and a keynote speech, we need a stage, we need a, a, a sound uh, system, we need a projection, we need seats and everything. So this is the material. And of course, also with digital technologies or digitalization as a social phenomenon, we can see that there are, in using these technologies, in trying to accommodate them and us to them, there is a change happening. Uh, and changes, and these changes in social practices, I recall them as social innovation. Any fundamental change in any of the elements of a social practice can constitute a social innovation. Something has changed. Our behavior has changed because we have probably changed meaning structures. Um, for example, uh, 13 years ago, I uh, sold my car and never owned one again. Um, my meaning structure was very different. I now use public transport and I do car sharing. I can use some of the skills that I learned uh, while driving my own car. And of course, I need the material because I need someone providing me the infrastructure. Uh, but my meaning system is very different from someone uh, in Germany who has in his or her mind the idea of freie Fahrt für freie Bürger. You cannot translate it really to non-Germans because it's one of these German expressions that does not translate well, but maybe you can ask a German what I just meant. Um, but this is a different kind of meaning. But I can use similar skills and uh, similar materials maybe. Of course, often the skills also have to change. The soup example for, uh, is, is one uh, when you really have to reskill yourself. Or when we talk about digitalization and these new products, um, being able to use these products requires a different skill set uh, than if I would not use the products. By the way, if I would try to repair these products, I would also need a rather different skill set. If you want to repair a digital product, uh, check out Repair Café Stuttgart. They are doing this once every month. Uh, and you can join uh, up uh, with them and they tell you how you can repair uh, your own stuff. However, if you want to repair your own stuff, you also need different materials. You need actually an electrical product, a phone, a smartphone, a computer that you can repair. And materials are, have a huge impact on all social practices. Once the materiality changes, everything changes. In the session that I had this afternoon, 
uh, co-chaired with, uh, with a wonderful woman from Australia uh, on the issue of consumerism respons responsibility. We rearranged the room. We made, uh, you know, just a nice circle as we like to do in, uh, in social pedagogy. Uh, and we had a fishbowl conversation with some chairs in the middle so that people could enter the, the, the circle and discuss and then move out again. As soon as you rearrange materials, meaning structures tend to change, skills are re-evaluated, and a new social practice emerge. And this is how we can have social innovation. So if you are a social innovator or a social entrepreneur trying to have that, think about what you're doing. How do you change the materials available? How do you change technologies available? How do you think about skills that people have to have in order to use maybe your product or your solution? And what about the meaning structures? Meaning structures are sometimes shaped by technology very strongly. The medium is always the message. Uh, and a hammer always looks for a nail. Uh, but meaning structures are also, uh, as ideas, important to make us want to have new skills, make us want to have the ability to make the tomato soup ourselves, make us want to lose our car and be finally free again, free at last. So, social innovation. Um, I was talking about sustainability, because for me as a social scientist that is now doing sustainability research for the past 16 years, that's when I started my PhD, uh, actually here in Stuttgart at the university. Um, all of these new ideas, all of these technologies, all of these ideas we have, what we can do with them, are completely meaningless until we are not clear what is the goal of all of this. And I am proposing sustainability as a normative and deeply political reference frame to orient all of these activities that we see also with you guys who are social innovators and maybe especially for you because this is a huge meaning uh, supplier sustainability and just also to clear up uh, what I mean with that and then coming back uh, to digitalization sustainability itself has also sort of a development in the past 40 50 years uh, uh, behind it we are, and we came a, far, a long way. We, we started out in the 70s, when you remember limits to growth, the older ones remember it, and my students, some of them are in the room, remember it because I forced them to, uh, to think about it, and we talked about it in class. The first impulse was always the resource imperative. Use only so much resources um, that can be replenished and are then available for others over the long run. This was an, a sustainability 1.0, if you like to say so. Um, but, we, but sustainability as a concept moved further. In the 80s, we had the idea that when we talked about uh, sustainability, we are talking about something akin to global justice. The famous Brundtland Report, Our Common Future. This was the idea that an economy and a political system has to work for everyone. Everyone living today, regardless in the global north or in the global south, if you're rich or if you're poor, especially if you're poor, or if you are not born yet. This is a great political uh, uh, impulse behind sustainability. Those of you who are management uh, people or have a managerial background know, of course, triple P or the triple bottom line, you know, planet, uh, people, and uh, profit. Uh, this is, in the last 15 to 20 years, was this a dominant economic understanding of sustainability and no company uh, on this uh, uh, great planet, at least not if you are listed in the DAX in Germany, can have not a sustainability strategy. You have to somehow say, how are you performing when it comes to planet, people, and profit? And since 2015, I would argue, and I'm following Andy, Andy Sterling here, uh, that sustainability now, with the passing of the Sustainable Development Goals by the UN, is an universal idea of humankind, akin only or similar only to universal human rights. And maybe sustainability is the last great uh, idea on a political level that we have where all countries on this planet have agreed upon as a reference frame. So this for me is when I say sustainability. It is a universal idea of justice, of ecological and social justice. And how can we incorporate this now? And what can digitalization play, uh, play here for a role? If we look at sustainability and digitalization, we have to look at the unsustainability of digitalization. If you are reading all these nice reports, um, I think Accenture did something with Deutsche Telekom and others, um, 
there is the argument that you can only achieve the sustainable development goals with digitalization. It is true. These technologies enable us to do things very, very differently and can empower lots and lots of people. However, I think we should first look at the problems that digitalization also brings about so that we can deal with these challenges in a more productive way. When we talk about digitalization, the unsustainabilities that we have to uh, keep in mind is that the digital is not virtual. The digital is not virtual. The digital is bloody real. And I mean bloody real. This new economy, you can call it economy 4.0 or 5.0 or whatever kind of number you want to assign, is actually the Iron Age 2.0. All these technologies, all these devices that you're now typing in, uh, are requiring precious metals and rare earth metals. And these metals do not fall from the sky, they come from somewhere. They are somehow extracted under certain labor conditions, under certain political conditions, and they come with a certain environmental footprint. So we have to think about this um, when we talk about digitalization and the proliferation of these products will just increase ecological pressures also. So we have to think about where do these uh, things come from? What are the origins? Uh, of these products. We have to think about recycling versus sustainability. Um, and I mean versus sustainability because there is, uh, and this is what uh, one of the board members of Umicore told me, great recycler in Brussels, in Belgium, um, with uh, lithium ion batteries, it was. Technologically, we can recycle lithium ion batteries. Economically, we need a certain scale, a certain volume. Uh, so we need more electric cars, actually, to make it economically feasible. However, he mentioned there is also a ceiling. There is an upper limit to scale to volume of these uh, lithium-ion batteries. If it's too much, it becomes ecologically unsustainable. So there is sort of a, a boundary here, how materially, how large this digital economy can grow, otherwise we will have significant problems. But we have to talk about recycling, about the circular economy, and this guy, and he was from the industry, he told me we also have to talk about the sharing economy. We cannot have the same amount, uh, and he referred to lithium ion batteries in cars, uh, then we have now combustion engines driving around this Energy and algorithms, which I pronounce German here, I'm sorry for that, uh, but you can follow me. I don't want to dive into this, but you know what uh, uh, energy consumption uh, blockchain calculations have. Um, and of course, the question is, are we just changing one reference frame, war for oil, and will we have war for metals? Check out the Deutsche Rohstoffagentur, the DERA in Berlin. Uh, they are pretty clear about these things. So the question here is actually, who has to suffer for the digital age? And I don't want to talk about suffering, but we have to accept it that we have to think about these issues. Okay, this is now all Mr. Burns and gloom and doom, but I also have a nicer picture for you. And this is what I hope, and what I think a lot of us believe in and want to work on. And this is where we can use uh, these technologies in a different way. That there is a sustainability of digitalization that we can achieve. Um, but this, we can only unlock it not by looking at the instrumental value of digitalization with energy efficiency, you know, smart homes or smart cities, which are technological fantasies, um, but if we are focusing on the social aspects and what they, these technologies enable us to do. And for me, and this is a hope, this new economy, this new digital economy can be a renewed modernity where uh, individual freedom but also conscious choice for social responsibility can go together. Um, and at the center of all of these ideas of a positive vision for a digital sustainability um, are issues like collaborative and co-creative economics. That suddenly the old boundaries between producers here active, value creating, we are moving into something uh, what we call a prosumer-oriented or producer-oriented economy. We're talking this also in our session uh, this afternoon, um, and how can we achieve that? Uh, not just that people become more conscious about what they consume, but that they become involved in it, that they become involved in the creation process. And digital technologies can do that. They are already doing it. Um, most of the software that you're using would not have been possible without prosumer or collaborative 
collaborative efforts, especially with the open source movement in the 1990s. Uh, and finally, some uh, examples or some buzzwords that you all know, the issue of the sharing economy, uh, which is a commercialized form of providing access, but still within the market logic. But also things like commoning, I just wrote in the last uh, word here, the commons economy. How can we uh, ensure uh, economic transactions beyond the market? This is hard with our digital technologies, but the digital technologies and algorithms can actually work around quite nicely around market mechanisms. There is not just a platform capitalism, as Sasha Lobo said, there is also the possibility and potential for a platform cooperativism. And that's interesting. How can we use them, not just on the market, but also off the market? Um, and also a re-evaluation of uh, repair and care activities within the economy and how can we use that. This is for me the promise, the great promise, if we really look at the social impacts and the positive social impacts of digital technologies for sustainability. And then the question is not who has to suffer, but who can be empowered through uh, uh, the digital age. And that is an interesting thing, to understand the digital age as an age of empowerment. Actually, that's very true to the California ideology of a Steve Jobs or so. Um, but again, I'm not naive to believe that tech entrepreneurs will save the world. I said in the session before, uh, tech entrepreneurs will only save the pensions of middle-aged white men in California. Um, so I'm almost done. Um, I want to throw in another word that I like to, un to, to just maybe throw into you social innovators here in the room because you guys have to build this world. I can only talk about it. Uh, I can try to change your meaning structures, but not more. Um, the word of conviviality. This is a word from a uh, philosopher and theolog uh, theologian Ivan Illich. And Ivan Illich uh, uh, is rediscovered in a lot of circles here with the repair community, with the degrowth community. A lot of people are focusing on Illich again. And what Illich was saying is, a society should be able to grant each and every individual the greatest degree of autonomy. And that's a very positive thing. And he was also saying the market economy is not doing that. The market economy is actually making us less autonomous. It made, they made us heteronomous. Heteronomy, the opposite of autonomy. If we over-rely on market capitalism, when we have to buy all the stuff which is of course, the center of, of commodity fetishism and consumer capitalism, we are de-skilled. We cannot really have these social practices uh, anymore. He was also skeptical about relying too much on social relations, on our neighborhoods. Those of you who are from small, uh, uh, small uh, 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 towns or so, or from a rural setting, maybe you are quite happy that you're living now in a big city and not in these two overly tight social relations. That can also be a problem. But there must be some place between over-reliance on market relations and between the over-reliance on social relations, where we have conviviality, the good life together. And for him, I just repeat this, conviviality for him is individual freedom realized in, not independence, but interdependence with each other, with you and me, but also with our natural environment, without which we could not live. So this is, for me, an interesting idea. And if you look up uh, convivial open source, for example, you suddenly find ideas how to construct product solutions algorithms that could last indefinitely or that could be repaired indefinitely. Um, uh, one colleague of mine, uh, uh, Lorenz Hilti from the University of Zurich said, he's an inf information scientist, algorithms are eternal, actually. You don't need to change them. But the kind we are programming them is utterly rubbish, and that's why they break all the time. And why, that's why they require updates and updates and updates. But we could do it very differently. And so just to uh, try to give not an answer, maybe an attempt to an answer to the question how this whole thing can be made more sustainable, how this digital age can become more sustainable. Going back to uh, this uh, idea of social practices, we need new meaning structures meanings that we all share, that provide sense, Sinnstiftung, sense-making. And sustainability for me is the normative reference frame here. All of your social innovation projects will go nowhere if you don't know why you want to do that. 
and sustainability is a hard, measurable goal and the only goal worth fighting for, in my view. The other thing is, coming from meaning to skills, this whole idea of co-creation, of collaboration, uh, that is both an idea but also requires skills. And I think we need a great reskilling of society here. Uh, and maybe these digital tools that can be playfully exploited. Just think how much you are playing with your smartphone games or, uh, or, or how much you are playing with a smartphone anyway. Um, maybe they provide an opportunity to reskill ourselves to really become these active co-creators and prosumers. And then, of course, we need convivially designed long-lasting and repairable digital products, be it physical products, be it software, infrastructures, whatever. And I think here is a great opportunity for social innovators to really fundamentally change a society and really make social innovations. But you cannot do it alone. You should not overburden yourself as social innovators to do it alone. You have allies. Search for them. Especially become political. Become active and make governments uh, uh, create a level playing field. If you are interested in all this stuff, and this is a bit self-advertisement, tomorrow at 4 o'clock we have a session on exactly these topics. And these sessions will be highly interactive, very conversational, fishbowl methods and other methods. Some of my students will be there and trying to take notes, so I invite you very much uh, if you like and if you have the time to come there. If you are interested in what I do or if you want to hook up with me, I'm a very public uh, scientist, so please uh, feel free to uh, follow me. Like and subscribe, as they say on YouTube. Um, you don't have to like and subscribe me, uh, but I hope that you pay attention and maybe think about some of these things, and I would be very happy to hear back from you. Thanks so much for your time and attention. Thank you very much. I have a spontaneous question for you. You mentioned the tech entrepreneur will not save the world. Yeah. Will the tech social so entrepreneur probably save the world? Uh -huh. um, we have to be careful. Uh, social is not a word we can put on, you know, as a label on something and then we're all good and can feel good when we go back home, you know, and sleep well. Um, we're all living in a system that makes it very hard to live a good life, a sustainable life that is really responsible in the long run. But what I think is interesting about social entrepreneurship or social innovators is that you are starting to think about something that's bigger than you and bigger than a market relation, that you're thinking about a public good. But if you're thinking about a public good and making something for the common good, then you have to realize that you are political activists and you have to team up with others that are thinking likewise. All economic actors are political actors, they just don't want to do it. But I think you are uh, a really good position to do that. Just don't try to go it alone. Try to team up, try to find collaborators, uh, but never be silent. Be citizens, not just entrepreneurs. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.